A very warm welcome from us all to Sharon White, back at the RTS, two years after her first interview as Ofcom's third chief executive. Then she said that those who worked in television were super special. But she didn't say if that was in a good way or a bad way. <laughs> and I suspect that uh, in these two years, she's probably had a major impact on the description of super special. Since she was here last year, she has uh, added vastly to her workload and perhaps her intake of ibuprofen uh, by taking on the task of regulating the BBC as well as her existing commitments for all of broadcasting and the telecommunications spectrum policy. Now, a big part of her remit is diversity, and two years ago, Sharon said that the media was less diverse than Whitehall or even the Treasury. So this morning, we are going to discuss Ofcom's diversity report, hot off the press. We'll talk about the Culture Secretary's rejection, not once, but twice, of Ofcom's advice on the proposed merger between 21st Century Fox and Sky, and the new term in the lexicon of broadcasting, non-fanciful concerns. <laughs> Who knew? Um, we'll talk about the revelation of BBC salaries, the gender pay gap, and the ensuing row over equality and transparency. And we look at Brexit, uh, the impact on the UK status as bro Europe's broadcast centre. I'll be talking to Sharon for roughly half an hour, and then as many questions from the floor as possible in the following 10 minutes. Um, Sharon, first of all, um, the diversity report out this morning, you called it shocking. Yes. But what are the headlines? Um, first of all, it's fantastic to be back. Um, I think what the report does is set out, I think, a very compelling but also very tough challenge for the whole of the industry. And I think two big messages. One, actually just the paucity of data. You know, too few broadcasters are actually routinely monitoring the makeup of our workforces. But secondly, to be frank, the information we do have shows shocking, woeful, choose your adjective, shows a, a, a significant underrepresentation, whether it's women, whether it's uh, disabled people, people from an ethnic minority background, particularly at a senior level. And I think Are any of the broadcasters worse than the others? Uh, so, you know, you'll see from the report, we have we picked out particularly the, 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 uh, t the five uh, biggest employees. Channel 4 actually does uh, well. The BBC, interestingly, I mean, the UK's national broadcaster um, is in the middle of the pack, and, and actually I believe the BBC really ought to leave, be leading the pack. But I think for all broadcasters, there are two big uh, priorities. Firstly, uh, actually, to get to a place where we are all routinely monitoring, measuring the, the, the makeup of our workforces. But secondly, and particularly for you know, broadcast chiefs in the audience, we need to take responsibility at the top of the organization to set targets and, and take action. Uh, there was a, a scurrilous rumor um, going around the BBC uh, on the question of ethnic diversity, that the first time uh, the BBC submitted figures, it had the whole of World Service, and it looked fabulous. So you'll be interested to see our report takes out the World Service from the BBC's numbers. It's all, it's a great thing about being a regulator. We've, we've set consistent standards. So the, so the figures today showing the BBC in the middle of the pack, not leading the pack, actually are without the World Service uh, numbers. Uh, just sticking to the BBC, in um, Karen Bradley's uh, revised list of your homework that she gave you in uh, July, uh, she seems to be entirely in tune with Lenny Henry, that you can't just be looking at on-screen um, ethnic diversity, you have to be looking at off-screen, because if you don't look at off-screen, then the people that are making the decisions will forevermore look like this room. As Greg White said, <laughs> as Greg said, hideously white. Yeah. So we've, we've set um, tough on-screen targets for the BBC. I mean, I agree with Lenny that it's important not just for the BBC, but for all broadcasters to set workforce targets. I've set them myself for Ofcom in the last two years. The, the issue that we're working through carefully, and these are proposals and will be finalising over the next few weeks, is whether the BBC should be setting workforce targets... David Clementi is the chairman of the board setting workforce targets with us as the regulator coming in behind and taking, holding the BBC to account or whether, the BB, whether Ofcom as the regulator should be setting the BBC's workforce targets. And that's the issue of the debate. But surely it would be better for the BBC to set its own targets. I mean, you know, Ofcom essentially 
that's not, is that really your job? So that's, so that's our current proposal. Our current proposal, which has been the subject of debate, is that the BBC sets its targets, and the BBC now has, and that our job is to shine a light of transparency as to whether the BBC is delivering so, or not. So, I mean, in, in the report this morning, you talked about the fact that I think it was like 57 broadcasters didn't even submit anything like nearly enough data. And then you're asking the Secretary of State for additional powers. Is it additional powers to collect data or additional powers, as it were, as, the, as Karen Bradley wants to do, as in the BBC, of finding the BBC if it doesn't have enough religious programs, children's or whatever? Do you want to do two things? Do you want to be in a position to come down hard if you don't get the data? And then in terms of the BBC, what would the action, the punitive action you would take if they don't actually do the work? So our big priority is the, is the information and transparency. So the issue at the moment is as a regulator, we have got the powers to require all the TV broadcasters who hold a license with us to provide data on gender, disability and ethnicity. We don't have the power, we ask and it's voluntary, but we don't have the statutory power to ask for data on the broader set of um, makeup, so whether that's sexual orientation or age. And so I've written to Karen Bradley to say, we want to get as much information out there. We believe in the power of transparency and therefore accountability. Can you please give us the powers to collect more information? There's then the question about, well, you know, we ask for the information and we don't get it back. What do we then do next? And for the 57 uh, broadcasters, as you say, who provided us with no information at all on their workforces, we are, you know, in, in the jargon of my previous life, writing stiffly worded memos. But we will take enforcement action if we need to. But what is that enforcement action? So at the moment, I hope to get to a position where uh, where uh, setting out that we could take sanctions will be the incentive for the broadcasters to say, look, actually, we've seen the report today. We think that actually having the transparency is incredibly important and that next year the data's in a, in a, in a better shape. Yeah, but that's that. But then if they do come up with the data and actually they're doing insufficient work and diversity, you don't have any big whip. So it is a condition of any broadcaster holding a license with us that they have got to have a plan in place to improve their diversity. Now, I don't want to get to a stage, I mean, this is a collective effort for the whole of the industry. I don't want to get to a stage where as the regulator, you're you know, cracking a whip uh, because I believe that the whole industry ought to be looking at the report today and saying, my God, this is a wake-up call. This is a challenge for all of us, and actually the incentive should be there for every broadcast chief to come forward. But we do have powers to enforce if, if, we, if it gets to that. But the, the, the problem with all this is there's one kind of diversity that you can automatically see, and that is the diversity of class. And it's not a protected characteristic under the Equality Act. I mean, class is a massive issue, and it's going to be the subject of a session. I mean, do you recognize there's a problem with class? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, John Snow was very interesting at the Edinburgh TV Festival on this. We've, we've said in the report it's a very, it's a really important issue because you want diversity of thinking, not just visible diversity. You know, we're in a creative industry where you want great ideas from people from different backgrounds, different classes, different colors, different parts of the country, at Scotland as well as, you know, as well as North London. And... Uh, we have said that next year we're going to ask the broadcasters to start thinking about providing us with, with more data on social class so we can start to get a, a better collective understanding of, of where we currently sit. But what, what were the indices? It's such a complex issue. I mean, it's, uh, you know. It's complex, but it's not impossible to do. So there are other sectors that already collect very robust information on social class. Some broadcasters, the BBC actually, has already started to do some work on it. So I don't think there are... I don't think there are uh, insurmountable obstacles to us having a clear view in a year's time at the next RTS as to how we, how we compare in terms of social class. Um, also what you have in the, um, in the diversity report as well is you just make a quick comment about uh, unpaid internships yeah. and you want them to end. Yeah, so um, I think it relates very strongly to the class point. Um, you know, the media is an industry in which uh, it can be who you know, what are the networks. It's not necessarily a criticism, it's the way, particularly if you're in a small company, uh, 
people may feel it's the easiest way to, to employ and bring people on. Unpaid internships, in my view, have the strong potential to reinforce and propagate uh, inequality and the disjuncture between the, the social class of the medium and the audiences that we're serving. And actually, a number of broadcasters have already taken the step. I think about Viacom's done some great work in moving to paid internships, moving to a more, uh, more structure in terms of the way in which they hire Channel 4, setting aside places for disabled people. So I would love to see a position in which we no longer have unpaid internships uh, in, in, the, in the TV and radio industry. Well, would you lobby to have them outlawed? I'm, I'm, I, I'm not going to, I mean, I guess it would be an issue for Karen Bradley this afternoon. I mean, I think part of the conversation today is for each broadcast chief to take a look at her or his organisation and to say, we're not doing well enough. And actually unpaid internships, unpaid internships move into a more open, more meritocratic way of bringing people into the industry and then moving people up could be a, a transformative way to, to make faster progress. Um, should we now move um, to uh, the Sky Fox uh, merger? God, you and Karen have a lot of correspondence, don't you? <laughs> um, you can imagine my summer holiday. Well, let's talk a bit more about that. Um, Ofcom said about the merger, not, not about plurality, but about the whole question of broadcasting standards, we consider there are no broadcasting standards concern that may justify a reference. Not once, but twice, has Ofcom been slapped down on this, which leads to the question, what is the point of view? Not personally. That's a, that's a very... What, not a point, not personally. What is the point? I mean, you're an independent regulator. You're asked for advice. Uh, you don't work for the government. You work for parliament. And not once, but twice. Have you been, has your advice been rejected? What do you think about that? So it's interesting, I don't see it uh, quite like that. So the, the, the way, funnily enough, because otherwise my children may be out of food and shelter over the next year with no it's job. It's okay, there's, there's obviously, you know, yeah, there are other, other, um, other, other, other lines streams. of work. Um, so the, the, <laughs> the way the process is, well, we've given our advice mm -hmm. and um, you know, we've gone through, as you can imagine, uh, those of you who've, been on the Ofcom website to read the correspondence for yourself. It's been a very, very careful, detailed um, process. And the way in which the system works is that the Secretary of State has got, she's got statutory discretion. She's the decision taker. And she's decided actually this morning. And she's decided uh, some of- not, She's some not of, minded to anymore, it's happening. She's made her announcement at, at all rules today. And, and that's how the process runs and I, I I think what's great about it is that there's transparency. So it is absolutely clear at each stage uh, the exam questions that we have been set, but also the advice that has been given. And as you say, we did advise that, they, that there, were, there was enough evidence to justify referral on media plurality, but not on the, the broadcasting standards consideration. Um, she suggests that Ofcom should have reviewed Fox News content looking for possible breaches that were not the subject of a complaint. So what do you think about that idea that you go trolling through programs? We, we, we are in, in the jargon and ex post regulator in that we, uh, the session this morning on news was, was a good illustration of that. So we regulate uh, programs as they're shown, although we do some ongoing monitoring. I think my broader point is that we, uh, we did, took the utmost care. Um, it has been a very, very detailed, very rigorous process. Uh, as I say, both on the broadcasting standards consideration with issues of corporate governance and so on, but on media plurality. And you know, our work, work stands now for scrutiny. Um, Secretary of State now has made a decision and then, you know, it's over to um, uh, my good friends at the Competition and Markets Authority uh, to do a, a further, further scrutiny. And what about non-fanciful concerns? So, <laughs> um, 
I was like, I just sort of, I'm trying to remember my summer holiday conference calls from <laughs> France on, uh, on uh, much of this. So we, we said that there were, on the, this is on the broadcasting standards consideration, we said that, that, that there were non-fanciful concerns in the jargon. Um, but from our review and our detailed scrutiny of all the evidence, um, our clear advice, we're not the decision taking, our clear advice was that those non-fanciful concerns did not uh, justify uh, a, a reference. Now, on the question of impartiality, I, I'm just trying to remember exactly how I read it, but Karen Bradley said that she was not content with the code. She thought there was an extra thing that was the spirit of impartiality, uh, which was not covered in the code. And um, on that whole question of reviewing, Ofcom says we do not agree that this, we, we think this would be an unwarranted restriction on freedom of speech. Tell me about that, because that's an extra layer as well. Um, I, I think maybe it might be helpful just to talk almost about our sort of general approach when we think about impartiality, because as, as many in the audience will also be subject to our codes, we look at due uh, impartiality as well as due, uh, due accuracy in the context of news and current affairs. We, considering that, obviously, the, 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 um, the, 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 the controversial natures and so on of the issues, but we're very clear that the approach that we've got with the broadcasting code, which is a tried, tested approach, has been absolutely the right way of, of, uh, of, 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 of playing into that assessment. So on the, the now, as you see, uh, Karen Bradley has gone to uh, Competition and Market Authority. Now, they're not a specialist, obviously, unlike Ofcom, uh, not a specialist regulator. So why do you think they would come to a different decision than you? It's over to them. I don't know if they will. Um, is there a danger that Karen Bradley is going to run out of regulators until she gets the right answer? <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, the, the great thing about the prescience of the organizers of the RTS is that uh, there's a great lineup today, which means you can then ask Karen Bradley directly this afternoon. <laughs> um, you can definitely ask Karen Bradley. In fact, you could even be in the audience and ask her yourself. <laughs> Uh, let's now turn uh, to another letter from Karen Bradley. This letter is in July, and this is on BBC regulation, and we've already touched on the Lenny Henry point. Essentially, this letter was, seems to suggest that actually you should actually be designing the schedule for BBC programmes. So, uh, Karen Bradley wrote uh, to me in July, and... Um, it's hardly surprising that on the subject of uh, the BBC and the regulation of the BBC that politicians of all parties uh, will, have, uh, will have views. The great thing about writing to us in the period when we are seeking lots of people's views on uh, precisely how we're going to pull together the framework, it's again, it's public and it's transparent. So uh, Karen Bradley's letter was published and my response, and indeed the response of uh, my chairman was also published. Um, we're seeking views, and as a regulator, an expert, independent regulator, the decisions that we take are independent of both political influence, but also of commercial influence, and I'm comfortable that will remain the case. So basically what you're essentially saying is that a letter from um, the cultural secretary, cultural secretary will be treated like a letter from Mrs. Smith from Birmingham. It will just be like one of the many submissions. Um, what I'm saying is the way in which, as you know, the BBC charter and agreement is set up is that the, the, the charter, so that framework, and David Clementi talked yesterday about the public purposes, those have been gone through a parliamentary process, but also an agreement between the government and the BBC. And, I, and what I'm saying very strongly is that when Ofcom, as an independent regulator, uh, taking the job of being accountable to Parliament very seriously, when we take our decisions on how we put that into practice, we do, not, we are, we do that without political influence or pressure. But do you get the sense, um, I mean, are you absolutely right, you know, you're appointed to be the independent regulator, the BBC deemed this to be an independent regulator. Do you get a sense now that the Secretary of State is trying to interfere in the process? No, not at all. So let me read you this, this short paragraph. I love this one. I'm trying to think whether, I can remember where the semicolons went. 
While a number of existing BBC Trust quotas for radio have been retained in the draft operating licence, there are some significant omissions. In particular, I note that some are all quotas for BBC Five Live Sport Extra, Radio 4 Extra, Radio 6 Music and Asian Network have not been retained with potential implications for commercial providers to complete these BBC radio services. This is an incredibly detailed and perhaps even proscriptive letter. Are, do you feel under pressure? No, not at all. Would you like me to say yes? No. I'd <laughs> no, like you to say at, that loudly. That's not, interesting. No, not um, at all. But let, let's, let's turn now to a different uh, point. And this was made um, by um, David Clementi last night. And he was talking in a different way about, about you know, you're, you're formulating your plan just now. It's going to then be set in stone. And he was saying that there is a, a tension between distinctiveness and quotas. So um, if you regulate, essentially if you regulate for quantity, the danger is you won't get that quality and distinctiveness. And his actual quote was a charter which places distinctiveness at its heart and then breaks it up with a license full of hourly quotas is a contradiction that is likely to lead to failure. Do you recognize that? So I don't see that trade-off and I, I know it's a, it's a point of uh, current discussion between us and the BBC. I think it's worth it's worth just remembering why Ofcom has been appointed as the first external independent regulator of the BBC, and it's because the, the system that we had previously, I think general wide agreement was fail, felt to have lacked, been lacking, because there was this fuzziness between regulation and governance. And I think I'm very conscious that as the regulator of the BBC, I don't want to be the person who is determining with thousands and thousands of targets, uh, the TV and radio schedules, which is why we're focused, I think, on the critical conditions, more demanding conditions, that will support distinctiveness, quality, and diversity. And I don't see a contradiction between um, uh, more hours of production, particularly in the nations, which is part of this debate, and distinctiveness. But let, uh, let, let's just go back to your own toolkit for a minute, because um, you had to really... Um, scale up to take on the BBC and do you I mean the, the room for distinctiveness I mean it, it is it is sometimes very subjective and I just wonder whether Ofcom is really um, qualified to look at distinctiveness um, although the BBC is a new responsibility we've been regulating the rest of the broadcasting industry for years and um, some of my colleagues are in the audience we've we've I believe got a wealth of experience and expertise as you say, distinctiveness is subjective, and that's why, as a regulator, we are evidence-based and why the, 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 um, such a focus for us is understanding what audiences, viewers, and listeners think. And when we asked them about distinctiveness, they said, we want to see more UK-originated programming. They're worried about what's happening with children's TV. They want us to address some of the decline on arts, music, and, and religious programming. And that's what we've reflected um, in, in the operating license, being very conscious of what the chance and agreement sets as the BBC's public purposes. And what about the fining system? So um, it, we formally are able to fine the BBC £250,000 if there is a, a breach in one of the conditions that we set. We're five months into regulating. We haven't even set the framework, so we will see. You know, I'm, I'm uh, a glass half full uh, person, and I think there is a um, there's a really effective new regulatory regime where the BBC sets out its creative plan, and the and the Ofcom comes in and in a transparent way is able then to measure it, its progress. Can we just turn uh, to um, the B BBC gender pay gap again and talk uh, about uh, the announcement that was made about the salaries? Are you surprised at the gender pay gap revealed? in the BBC list of payments? Am I surprised? I guess I was surprised by the extent, um, and you know, it's, you know, it clearly isn't right uh, that men and women or people from different backgrounds are paid different rates um, uh, simply because of, 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 of their gender. The pay, pay is not, a, it's not an area where Ofcom has got a, got a lockers, but it's an area, certainly we as an organization have been working very hard 
uh, to address some of our own gaps, and it's clearly, a, it's, it's, it's clearly an issue that's been very but sensitive and controversial. It is sensitive and controversial, and I wonder as well about transparency and yes. clarity and, and, and equality in the eyes of the law. Yeah, I think what's, what's really striking for me from this debate over the last few months is what it says again about the importance and the power of transparency. And it's, I sort of see, I guess, a sort of analog between uh, the, the, the gender pay uh, data information and what we're trying to do on diversity. You can't fix what you don't understand. And I think transparency, I think, is incredibly important. Will be a, um, you know, some people fear transparency. I personally think transparency creates trust you know, with your workforce trust with uh, the public. And it's one of, I think, our most important tools in, in, in our role with the media sector. Um, now turning uh, to Brexit, uh, what worries you most about the impact of Brexit on broadcasting? Um, so as a, you know, as, a, as, a, as a regulator, we have no view on uh, whether Brexit is a good or bad thing. But having taken the temperature of um, the industry in recent months, the issue that sort of uh, flashes red um, within my remit is the country of origin principle. Yeah. So, you know, we've been very lucky to have lots of broadcasters based in the UK who don't necessarily broadcast to a UK audience, um, but are here because we have got a sort of reciprocal arrangement in terms of recognising each other's uh, standards. So that's something we've obviously been discussing with the government, making the argument, making the case, and I think it's understood, but it's obviously a, a, a subject of, of the negotiations. Yes, because it's, you know, it's, you know, it's Disney, it's Discovery, it's yeah. NBC, it's Universal, who may well up sticks to Amsterdam or Paris or wherever, if the Ofcom license is no longer recognised in EU countries, and that's incredibly, presumably, you know, whatever you think about Brexit, detrimental to, what is it, five billion yes. pounds to the British economy. I agree, and that's why of all the, of all the sort of regulatory issues, all the issues on, in my entry on Brexit, the country of origin principle is the single most critical one. We don't want to see. But if we're outside the single market, that has to die. Well, I mean, we'll see how it, how it unfolds. For us at the moment, we are doing everything we can to represent the voice of the industry with government in terms of um, uh, making the case for the country of origin principle featuring high in the negotiations. But what also about um, you know, the, the, the free movement of talent? I mean, that's not, you know, clearly, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue for the industry. It's obviously not an area that yeah. comes directly uh, into, our, uh, into our purview, but it's, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a concern that we hear a lot in all the discussions that we have with both the media side, but also actually got Virgin here today, also on the, on the telecom side of our work. Um, also, when you were here two years ago, um, you said that uh, you used to do your homework to a background of EastEnders or a variety of soaps. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder now that you are the chief executive of Ofcom, uh, what's on in the background when you're doing your homework? Funny, my mother was a great, um, my mother was completely obsessed with Coronation Street and uh, uh, Crossroads and EastEnders for years. And I got to the stage where basically I'm unable to work without the TV in the background. And uh, it's been replaced the last few months. My husband and I have been watching, in fact, re-watching probably for the fourth time, um, box sets of Line of Duty. Right. If okay. anybody, anybody <laughs> was involved in the Line of Duty, I quite like harrowing crime. Right. Well, I mean, that's, that's a... That's a Tremendous, but what about new work that's going out in <laughs> broadcast? There's nothing new that takes yeah, your fancy. It's in the last in the last year, I mean, we family viewing is very much sort of Bake Off now Tuesday night. I have to remember with uh, my children. My in fact, I had a, my 12-year-old ran out of the room screaming as Flo was voted off on Tuesday night. So we are uh, we're Bake Off. And off can fix that. He just, <laughs> it was very worried about Noel Fielding in the fridge. Um, so we do Bake Off, we do Strictly, and probably in the last year, the things I've really enjoyed have been um, probably the Adrian Lester undercover, I yeah. thought was um, absolutely fantastic. My husband was loved handmade tear. I just, I was watching like this. I just found it all a bit too not escapist and gruesome, but we read the, we read the novel over Not the escapist summer. and gruesome, like being the chief executive of Off. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Anyway, we have indeed 11 minutes and 54 seconds. I'd like the audience lights up, please. And let's have questions, please, from the audience. 
Question straight away, who's got their hands up? Yes, front row here, can we get a, a microphone down here at the front row? Thank you, just say who you are before you state your question. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Deborah Williams, the Creative Diversity Network. Um, you've ruined my all four viewing for the weekend about flow now. Oh, I'm so oh. <laughs> But aside from that, no, it's fine, it's all right, I'll let you off, it's okay. We had a long um, debate as to whether flow was, did anybody who watched last year whether flow was the new vowel? See, there That's basically you go. been my conversation exactly. for the last 48 hours. Sorry, that's not my question. I'm so, I'm so sorry. So sorry. Uh, that's not actually it's nothing to do with what I'm going to ask. So, okay, so um, as you're aware, we, we produced the um, first diamond report uh, about a month ago, um, and I s wanted to know... Uh, whether or not you thought there were synergies between yeah. the, the uh, data that we produced and what you've produced this morning, and whether or not we should be working closer together to get the um, industry uh, slightly more aligned around how it collects its data and represents itself. I mean, yes to all the above. I mean, we're very strong supporters of Diamond, and we've um, been, I think, constructively uh, involved. I think, you know, the more Diamond and we can work together so that there is a... Uh, a, an open and consistent picture of, um, of the makeup of our industry, the better. And I think, I mean, I'm very positive about today's report because I think whatever the detail, it's the first time we can look at ourselves and see in a consistent way, you know what, there are some good examples here, mm. but actually the picture overall is, is, is very disappointing. So yes, I hope we can work even more closely together in the future. Yes, and a question is three from the back, uh, microphone four, come down. Yep, thank you very much. Hi, Sharon, Daniel Toole from IBM. I, I may be asking this question in the context of a former life. I, I wonder if you might be able to answer this question. Um, in the context of plurality, mm. in the UK context, how do you view plurality across multiple channels versus a single channel? Uh, and I'm trying to ask the question carefully, given the context. So I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, in the US, you have plurality, but polarised views in broadcasting, if I'm oversimplifying. Right. Oh, you mean on, in, yeah. in terms of impartiality? Yeah. Yes. Does it need to be on a channel or just in the ecosystem? Um, I mean, obviously, this is... <laughs> well, for... It's, 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 it, I'm a bit constrained in what I can say, obviously, because of the, Go the, on. the current process. Um, but I think what's... Uh, I say well, probably, maybe if I focus on, the thing that has been most interesting to me in the work that we, the sort of evidence gathering we did on media plurality in the UK, and obviously we looked at every platform, TV, radio, newspapers, online, is the extent to which the, uh, the content online is actually coming from the traditional uh, broadcasters. So on the one hand, obviously there's this, you know, there's this huge and growing ecosystem at the same time, what the, what the expansion of digital viewing has done has actually been to, to some degree, to reinforce the traditional broadcasters, traditional broadcasters subject to the impartiality code, as well as, as, well as the um, traditional newspapers. And that's, if that's a an partial answer, that I think has, has been a very st striking and, to me, unexpected um, uh, finding. Uh, gentleman on the right, yes. Would you say who you are, please? Yeah, um, Ed Shed from Deloitte. Um, uh, are Google and Facebook media companies? I think they are. And do they need to be regulated? And if you know, and, and in what kind? So I'm. Uh, I I don't think regulation is the answer because um, I think it's really hard to navigate the boundary between regulation and and and, and censorship of the internet. Um, I do think, though, that the the companies need to take more responsibility as, as publishers as well as platforms. And I also think, to be frank, that content providers uh, and advertisers, uh, as you're beginning to see, need to be increasingly fussy about the environment in which they're putting their, yeah. their content. So, so, for example, anyway, th this would, this would uh, obviously exist with uh, all, all the mainstream broadcasters, but just take the BBC. Do you have concerns? The BBC content could be on the same page as something that's not regulated and therefore could have a natural, um, in, in, the, in the viewer's mind, looking, could actually be one and the same in terms of probity. Yes, I mean, if I'm a broadcaster with my material going online, I want to make sure that's in an environment that's 
that's trusted, including the BBC. Including but the BBC. do you think the BBC then has, and the other broadcasters yeah. then have their own responsibility to make sure that their material doesn't go on a page which is in any way dodgy? Yes, com I completely agree. And I think that's part of the drive, actually, to... to I, I hate the term fake news. I prefer it, you know, can you trust it news? But I think that's absolutely the drive, not regulation, but the pressure from the content providers. Uh, questions? There was somebody up the back there, but I missed them. No. Uh, yes, yes, right beside you, a lady there, yep. Hi, Catherine Rushton from the Daily Mail. Um, yesterday, Sir David Clementi said that uh, the target to even up gender pay um, was, I think, not a legal requirement, but an aspiration. This morning, the BBC has been trumpeting how much better it's doing this year than last year. Um, and sort of diminishing the problem. Do you think they've really taken it to heart and got a handle on it? So gender pay, you'll be pleased to know it's not us because um, actually all the, the, the transparency on gender pay was a very specific agreement between the government and the BBC. I think what our report on the workforce shows today is that there is definitely more to be done for the BBC to be leading the industry. They're not there yet. And of course there is the Equality Act. Absolutely. Um, there was someone else's hand. Yes? No, Catherine Rush has done. Uh, anyone else? Yes, up at the back on the left, number four, microphone, please. Thank you. Could you take it? Thank you. Hello, uh, Wilfred Genev from D. Shaw. Um, how much assistance is Ofcom going to provide to the CMA as it reviews broadcasting standards, which is not something the CMA traditionally does? <laughs> uh, I think the, the CMA is gonna, going to have to decide its process with previous. Um, investigations, so for example, some people will know that the CMA looked at um, the merger of two of the big telecoms mm -hmm. companies, BT and EE. They may call on us as a sort of an expert witness almost, but how that process is going to run, uh, we don't know. And you wouldn't do any extra work, given all your work is out there, all your workings are out there, yes. and why would you, I mean, they would have to pay you, wouldn't they? First of all, you want me out of a job, you want my sh regulator shut down, and now I'm going to be paid twice. I think this is, <laughs> the, 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 the conversation's going much better. Okay, uh, microphone two coming up now, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Alex Wilkes from Avaz. I'm curious to know what you think of, of what's happened with Fox News in this country recently. I understand that um, James and Lachlan Murdoch had a meeting with you in May where they said, here's a compliance policy, we're gonna make Fox News, News compliant with our broadcasting standards. And then last month, they withdrew Fox News entirely from UK screens. I wonder what you make of that. You'll have to sort of bear with me, given this is, an, this is a process that's, that's, that's now going on. I'm sort of quite limited, given, you know, I, I can't prejudice that. I mean, obviously, Fox News is no longer, we no longer have a license at, at, at their request. It's a commercial decision. It's a commercial decision for them. And obviously, um, Karen Bradley is concerned about what is called foxification. That's a complete blank face to me now. <laughs> You'll have to go to Karen this afternoon, I think. Any more questions? We've got a couple of minutes left. Okay, yes, very, very briefly, please. Thank you. Uh, Simon Albury campaign for broadcasting equality. It was terrific to re read your report this morning. I've just got a couple of data questions. Uh, Article 14 requires diversity of supply. Will you be seeking data from the BBC on diversity of all supply? And also, I couldn't find, it may be there, uh, data on diversity of people in creative roles making programs for the UK audience. I don't know if it is there, but if it isn't there, is that something you'll be looking for in the future in your report? Thank you. So on the second question, we asked broadcasters um, to let us know about who, um, people in programming roles. Now, partly because the data, the information is, each broadcaster will have a view as to whether that's entirely production or whether those are some uh, on the screen roles. It's, it's, it's for them to identify. On the question about whether we're going to be looking at the supply uh, chain for the BBC, so obviously the BBC works with um, commissions um, indies. Uh, what we've said so far, and it's, it's, you know, it's the subject of the consultation before we finalize the, 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 the exact conditions, is that we will be very interested and will set as a condition 
uh, uh, the BBC contracting commissioning with producers who themselves have got a diversity plan both on screen and off screen. Any more questions? We've got time for just one more. Yes? Up there, please. Joe Mays from Bloomberg. Um, Ofcom faces a, the prospect of a judicial review over its fit and proper ruling uh, on uh, Fox as a, as a media owner. Um, to what extent are you concerned by that prospect? If I told you how many uh, 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 items of litigation across the full panoply of Ofcom's work, uh, it's, it, I, I take the fact that we make decisions they're public, um, there is a parliamentary accountability, there's public account accountability, there is scrutiny through the courts as, as the system working. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a very big thank you to Sharon White. <laughs> <laughs>